The fashion industry is regularly quoted as being, I think, the second most polluting industry in the world. So why is it that we've come here to talk to you and specifically to Johnston Zavelgen about the future of fashion? Why do you care about that? I think one of the one of the differences about what we do here is we produce everything here. Everything's made from the fibre that comes in right through to the finished product is done here. And that's because we've got this really traditional model and everything's based here and we're in our own community that we've always believed in doing things the right way. So we don't pollute the local river, we look after the staff. That's really exciting. You have mentioned before the comparison between what you might do here and how an average t-shirt might be made, for example. Can you describe that? Yeah, so typically if you're making an average consumer fast fashion product, you'd produce the cotton in one country, the polyester would come from an, a petrochemical source, you'd put them together, you'd spin a yarn in one country, make the fabric in another country, sew it potentially in another country again, and it'd be travelling around the world using products which are a long, long way away from the brands who are then making the final decision. So it's not on their doorstep, it's not visible to them, and it's much more difficult for them to control what goes into it, who's looked after in the supply chain, uh, and all those things that we've lost. You know, when we moved the whole global supply chain for the fashion industry overseas, we stopped taking responsibility in the same way for it. And for many companies, you could probably say that it's actually been convenient that the production has happened in different places around the world because you don't have to be responsible for it if you can't be responsible for it. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's, it's lower cost to do that. But what we're doing here is we're making the finest possible products we can. So it's made sense to keep them where the skills are to get that really high quality. So it's kind of because of that that we're doing things the way that we are. But when it comes to what we're trying to achieve today and making a more sustainable product, that's where it really helps because we have that total control. And if you're, if you're doing it offshore, if you're doing it in another country, you don't feel that same level of responsibility. Unfortunately, many designers, many fashion buyers don't even get to go to the factories nowadays. You know? So when we have people coming up here, sometimes it's the first time they're actually getting to step foot inside a, a factory. We're the oldest textile mill in Scotland. We were founded here in 1797, and we've remained at this very location for 224 years. And this is our archive. This is where we keep the really old records. These books are full of old patterns, old fabrics that we developed um, you know, 50, 100 years ago. We've got the records here of us bringing in the first cashmere to be woven in the UK. So it's, uh, it's a wonderful to have this history but that's the bedrock for the innovation and for all the new things that we're trying to do today. One of the things I love about my cashmere sweater and other things that are premium and really high quality is they last a long time and that has got to be a part of our future. You've mentioned earlier the challenges of fast fashion, the impacts of fast fashion. Yeah. How important is that to you here to have clothing that actually people wear for a long time rather than thinking of it as just for this season? And that, that's undoubtedly the biggest thing we can do as a society, is actually consume less, to, to make really careful decisions, buy good quality, wear garments for a long time. Would people be quite surprised at hearing a company that retails products say buy less? Probably. But to be honest with you, that's the only way. I mean, we, we're seeing garment consumption going up and up and up every year. Um, that growth is being powered by petrochemicals. That growth is all coming on plastic fibres. So when you look at it, the cotton business isn't growing. The, the, the cashmere and wool business is not growing significantly. What we're seeing is more and more plastics being used for more and more clothing, which typically doesn't last, which will maybe be worn for a season. Sometimes people are disposing of garments that they've never even worn because they get them home, they bought them as a bargain, and, and they don't like them anymore. So we need to really start thinking about this, maybe buying clothing like you would buy furniture. You're buying it as something that you want to last. And what is the problem with synthetic fibres in general? Quite a lot of people don't really understand that. So synthetic fibres are basically plastics. And obviously we talk a lot about the problem with microplastic pollution going into, into the, the ocean. A lot of that is coming from when you wash clothes at home. Every time you wash those clothes and they're plastic fibres, it's shedding microplastics, which are going out of your washing machine, into the drain and eventually into the ocean. Um, so natural fibres, particularly natural animal fibres like wool and cashmere, will biodegrade in the seawater. So what are some of the interesting innovations in the wool industry? So 
you can use wool for pretty much everything, to be honest with you. I mean, it's a great material for, for performance, as we said, and for keeping you warm. Um, one of the most exciting things I've seen recently is a company called Next Gen Tree Shelters, which is making um, the, the tube protectors that you get for saplings growing in the countryside. So replacing all those tubes, which are currently plastic, and don't biodegrade in the countryside. And don't grow with the tree. And don't grow with the tree. So they're replacing those with a, a wool tube, which is protected with cashew nut oil and that wool tube will biodegrade over the first five years of the tree's life and that will mean that you don't have to remove it from the countryside, it doesn't pollute the countryside um, and that tree will be able to continue growing. It seems to me like there could be plenty of uses and I'd really love to see a lot more of that. We could obviously have less sheep in this country um, from a biodiversity and wildlife and use of space perspective but making use of any of that wool that is, um, that is being produced just seems to make so much sense. Basically what we try to do is take every single product that comes into the, to the mill, so all the wool, all the cashmere, at the end of the day you'll, you'll trim off different bits as you're going through the stages, you'll remove the shorter fibres you will trim off the, the edge when you're weaving, which has been used to hold it in the machine. So all these bits of waste that occur, we will find a use for them. So we're up to now 97% of the waste that comes out of our processes is reused into another product. One of the big initiatives in that is every piece of yarn that we made gets made into a garment. So we will take that and we'll make that into a knitwear product which will sell under our Every Yarn label, which is basically uh, product which is not in our fashion collection, it's the colours that we have available because it's left over and we'll sell that as a discount because it's a way of using up that excess yarn and making sure it doesn't get wasted. And you are marketing also your product, which is a premium product, yeah. on the sustainability of it as well. Why do you feel that that is also important for customers? Do you feel that there's been a, a recent or a growing demand from the general public? So one of the things that's allowing us to go much further is that the consumer now wants to know those stories, wants to get that, that real certainty. Not that everything is perfect because we've got a long, long way to go as a whole industry, including us, but that we're making progress and we're considering every single decision. What do you think the government could do, for example, to support those kinds of shifts the, for industry to start collaborating on the, the big challenging issues? Is there anything that leaders at COP26 could be sitting and thinking, that's what we can do to, to make this happen quicker? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things, to be honest with you. I mean, firstly, there's funding research. There's supporting mm. companies with the exploration. You know, it often costs a lot of money and a lot of time just to understand what the options are how you might decarbonize a process, how you can investigate that. You have to lean into that and do that for quite a long period of time before you even evaluate whether the project works. Um, so that stage they can help with. And then the financing of it. Quite often the issue is cash, you know, and, and that's one thing where governments can get access to cash and put it into schemes at a relatively low cost to companies so that you can do some of this stuff, particularly the stuff that has a payback. Um, that's, that's fascinating to hear those sorts of innovations. And I think... Uh, we should all be experimenting as much as possible at the moment. Um, thanks very much for your time. If you found that story inspiring, uh, feel free to go to Johnson's of Elgin for more information. Come here for a full a tour of the mill um, and follow the, our expedition on climatechallenge.live. Uh, follow Conservation Without Borders on YouTube and social media. And if you're interested in looking at your own personal carbon footprint, go to countusin.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, not for donuts, but I hear your bakery is quite special. Is it still open? <laughs> <laughs>